are recording right now. So let's get us officially started. Um, welcome everyone and good evening. Uh, those of you who are able to join us tonight, thank you. My name is Corey Kalahar and I'm the Assistant Director uh, for Learning and Teaching here at the Wenatchee School District. Um, we're just just very excited to have a great program this evening and for all of you listening to walk away with some tools and some ideas uh, to help leverage and build social emotional learning in your home and in your family. And as you know, I mean, to say the least, it's been an interesting couple of years as we've muddled through the pandemic and begin to learn or began to learn how to cope with this world of uncertainty. Um, during this time, um, uh, we've also increased our capacity to learn how to be flexible, to learn how to be patient, uh, to learn how to be resilient and live in a, with a constant of change. I know that I've grown a tremendous amount during this time uh, and learned a great deal about myself and then my networks uh, that I have in my life to support me in the times of struggle. Um, just really appreciative of the power of friendship and family. And often um, these two important aspects of our lives are one in the same. So all of this is just for me to say that the Wenatchee School District Wellbeing Project uh, knows the importance of today's conversation in striving toward healthy relationships and life outcomes. And so I really am just really excited about getting us started. And uh, I'd like to introduce a new friend of mine, someone who brings positivity um, and energy and passion to everything that she does. And uh, just love to go ahead and turn over the webinar to you, Dr. Meza, um, and, uh, and get this party started. Sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everybody for um, attending tonight and or watching um, post our live webinar. I'm Dr. Liz Dexter Mazza. I am a clinical psychologist based out of Seattle, Washington. And Wenatchee is one of my all time favorite places in the state to visit regularly um, for both water and ski activities. So I love coming out to your neck of the woods pretty regularly. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk here tonight because as a clinical psychologist, I've been in private, been doing clinical work and research and academic settings and private practice settings for over 20 years now and working a lot with teenagers and young adults and adults um, in outpatient therapy, um, treating mostly suicidal, life-threatening behaviors, self-injury and other impulsive behaviors. And about 15 years ago, my husband and I, he's also a psychologist, started really thinking about why do so many kids have to wait till they're struggling so much that they need outpatient clinical treatment to learn life skills and how to regulate their emotions, how to understand things. Oops, sorry about that. Um, the life of having a dog in the background, I apologize. I'm gonna just close the door real fast. And this is the life of the pandemic that we've all been having to deal with of how to manage things in and out um, in the moments with stressors of life happening while you try to work, take care of your kids, to help them do school, all these things. And so with all that, like we've just come to what do we need to do to help families and schools teach social emotional skills as a foundation of elevating our children um, in a way that supports them as a whole, both their academic selves, their physical selves, their social selves, and their emotional selves. And that's really kind of why I'm here tonight. And so grateful that the school district brought me in to help all of you with this um, and just kind of share with you some of the key skills that we think are really helpful and important in managing social emotional health for both ourselves as adults and kids. And I will tell you all the things, skills and strategies I'm going to talk about tonight really do refer to both our kids and ourselves as adults um, on this. And so really grateful to all of you for being here once again. All right. So first, I just want to kind of talk about some of the data we have from the last two years where Mostly I wanna share this with you so that if you know that you or your kids or someone in their schools have been struggling, um, they're not alone. This has been a really big thing happening in the last two years where we've been paying more attention to the mental health needs of our kids and their experience with emotion dysregulation. 
just in the year 2020, there was a 31% um, proportional increase in the number of emergency room visits for teenagers um, as compared to, for mental health related visits, as compared to non-medical mental health related visits from 2019. That's a pretty significant increase. Um, we know 20% of kids are experiencing depression, 30% um, are developing substance use disorders now, and another third of teenagers are experiencing experience anxiety. That's pretty significant. And I'm sure you're all experiencing that in your home as well. Um, sorry. Um, so I really just kind of want to keep thinking through that with all of you as to say, like, if you're experiencing this for yourself or at home with your kids, you're not alone. This is common and happening everywhere, which just speaks even more to my passion of why we have to start teaching our kids skills proactively from an upstream approach rather than reactively and waiting for them to be struggling so much. So with that, I wanna kind of move forward and tell you about kind of the first and foremost set of skills that I think is critical that we teach and learn is a skill of mindful awareness. Um, so, and when I say mindful awareness, it's the ability to really be present in the current moment without judgment and without trying to change things, to really be here now. Um, so often when I think kids and people hear about mindfulness, the first thing they start thinking is, oh, you want me to meditate? You want me to do that breathing and relaxation stuff? And that's not what we're talking about when we talk about mindfulness. We want you to be able to be aware of what's happening inside of you and around you and to be able to put your attention where you want it to be in the moment rather than where your emotions want it to be. Um, we want you to help our kids to recognize when their emotions are running the show. And when our emotions are running the show, that's what we call emotion mind or emotional mind, where um, your decisions, your behaviors, those are all happening as a result of high intense emotion. Um, and you can't think about anything that from a logical or factual um, point of view. When we are thinking about things logically and factually only, we call that reasonable mind. And in reasonable mind, we've completely cut out all emotion or values. Um, and sometimes we like bop and bounce back and forth between the two. Like, here's what I know and think to be based on fact, doesn't matter how I feel, versus here's what I feel and all that matters is what I feel um, in emotion mind and it all doesn't matter logic, reason, or fact. When I bounce back and forth between those, I can feel overwhelmed and unskillful. And what we're teaching kids how to do is how can you hold both together? How can you hold your emotions and your reason together at the same time? And we call that wise mind. And why this is an important fact that I wanted to share with you is because I want you to start being able to have a common language to use in your classrooms or in your home to describe these states of mind when you notice for yourself or your kid has high intense emotion. You might say something like, do you think emotion mind's running the show right now? Or do you think this is an emotion minded decision or a wise minded decision? Um, and just being able to take that judgment off and recognize that when we have high emotions, that can be difficult. And if we can be aware of it, then we can start following the path to how to get back into our wise mind. And so when emotion mind takes over, just to give you a little bit of my non-scientific biology background, what we're talking about with our states of mind is, um, this, I always, I refer to this part of my head, my brain as my prefrontal cortex. This is where the executive functioning center of my brain is, where I make decision-making, where I have self-control. And then down here is what I think of as the downstairs brain, right? My amygdala or my limbic system. And that's where my emotions are occurring and firing from. And when our prefrontal cortex shuts down, and our emotion mind, our limbic system is firing and that's in control, right? That's what we call, um, that's when it occurs where no new problem solving can occur, no new learning can occur, and our, we've got distorted thoughts, right? And that all makes sense if our executive functioning center of our brain is shut down, 
right? And if our limbic system, our emotional mind is activated, that's when we feel really intense physiological sensations associated with those emotions, like twisted stomach or nausea when you're anxious or like chest pain and weight when you're feeling embarrassed or shame. And you can only think about that emotion over and over and over again, right? That's what happens um, with these different parts of the brain. So uh, you think about like reasonable mind is when only our prefrontal cortex is maybe we're really rigid in our thoughts and um, being really rule bound. Um, and emotion mind is when only our limbic system, our amygdala is in control, right? And our emotions are making all the decisions. And when we find wise mind, that path to wise mind that we're looking for is where we want to open up. This is my scientific description of neural pathways. We want to open up the neural pathways. So both parts of our brain are online and working together. And we can do that by using our mindfulness skills of describing what we see non-judgmentally. You can say, um, you know, I can tell you're, you look angry because you're screaming, you're yelling, your face is flushed, um, which is very different from saying, I can tell you're pissed off. Or if I say, you know, that guy's a jerk. When I call someone a jerk, that's a judgment. And judgments also tend to fuel the intensity of our emotions. I think of them as emotional, um, lighter fluid, on the flame and the more judgmental we are, the more intense our emotions are. So if I say that guy's a real jerk or he's being really stupid, that makes me more angry, more frustrated versus saying that guy was driving so fast they swerved in front of me and I got really scared and angry that they almost ran me off the road. It takes more words, but it doesn't fuel the intensity of my fire, my emotional fire as much. So that's why we want to practice being non-judgmental and describing things non-judgmentally. Like I said, we want to bring our attention to being right here, right now, not thinking about the past or the future too much. We want to be effective. This is one of my favorite skills that I teach kids is the skill of effectiveness, which really is shorthand for saying, is this behavior in line with your long-term goals? Is this what you want now or is it what you want most? Um, as a way of getting us back to, right, is this a short-term or long-term solution right here, right now? Is it what I want now or is it what I want most? And that's different. Be asking if something's effective or ineffective is non-judgmental. You know, saying that behavior, when I say that behavior is appropriate or inappropriate, that's shorthand for good or bad. It's not linked to any goals. When I say, is it effective or ineffective? Meaning, is, does it get closer to my goals or not? And that can help to de-escalate a situation as well. And then we also will talk about a dialectical perspective in a few moments um, as helping us get back into wise mind and then other skills we can use as well. But I really wanted to start with the importance of being in the present moment and being mindful um, by, and one of the ways we can be mindful is to describe things non-judgmentally, bring our attention to the present and asking ourselves, is this what I want now or is it what I want most? Is it in line with my long-term goals? So, so those were just a few of the mindfulness skills I wanted to bring to your attention for you to think about and practice at home. The next thing I want to talk about is, okay, so where do I focus as a parent or an adult when I'm trying to help kids, either in my classroom or at home? And in DBT, we really think about this idea of we're always looking for a dialectic or a balance in life of acceptance and change, validation and problem solving that we can help our kids, that we don't always have to move towards problem solving and fixing things, that we often will get further and faster if we start with validation and acceptance of where they are. So what do we validate? I want you to think about this concept of validation does not mean praise and validation does not mean encouragement. Validation means I get you, I understand you, 
and what you're experiencing right now makes sense. And the number one thing we can always validate for our kids are their emotions or for anybody, if in any human, we can validate the other person's emotions. We can say things like, I hear you, this is really sad. And then sit there and allow them to experience that sadness and be in that sadness with them. Um, or we might say, it makes sense that you're worried about this, given um, you don't know what the outcome's gonna be. Or I'm frustrated too. Acknowledge that their emotion makes sense given what they're thinking in a, a certain situation. And then after we've validated them, we can ask them, do you want some help getting through this? Notice that I said, do you want some help getting through this? Not, do you want help feel, to feel better? Our goal should not always be to help our kids feel better because we have to teach them how to sit with and experience painful emotions, sadness, anxiety, anger. Those are all human emotions. They're not good or bad. And so the ability to teach our kids to have that emotion and to act effectively with that emotion is really important. So I might say something like, would you like some help solving this? Um, would you like help figuring it out? Are you open to hearing some ideas or suggestions to help you get through this? Right, so remember that part too, right? We don't always wanna make our kids feel better. We wanna help them to get through it. And that may be by helping them distract so they don't make the situation worse, or it might be sitting there and comforting them while they're crying. Those are all options for us. So we start with validation and then we ask them if they'd like help getting through it. And so if you're wondering like, how do I know if my child's emotion makes sense? Um, how do I know if it's valid? A question we always ask is, does the emotion fit the facts? And you might wanna take a picture of this screen that might be helpful for you, that there are certain general categories or types of situations in where our emotions make sense. For example, fear and anxiety make sense when there's a threat to your life or someone you care about, when there is a threat to your health or your well-being. Right. So if I'm a kid and I'm really worried that I'm going to fail this test that I have coming up, right, that's a threat to my well-being. If passing my classes and not being retained is important to me and my, how I'm doing overall, um, just as if I'm afraid to fly because I think it's dangerous and unsafe. And there could be an accident, right? That's a threat to my life or someone I care about. So that's those are situations in general where anxiety and fear might make sense. One of the most important ones, I think, to always recognize is to talk about anger. When does anger make sense, right? Or And anger, I'm talking about anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, um, being pissed off and rageful, right? It can be from low level to high level. Anger fits the facts and makes sense when an important goal of yours is blocked or prevented, right? When someone you care about is attacked or hurt by others, or I might be in a situation where I'm losing power or respect, right? In those situations, anger makes sense, right? So when I was told as a kid that I could play video games after school and it's the thing I've been looking forward to all day, and all of a sudden there's a shift in the after school schedule and now I've got to go with my parents to take my brother to some um, appointment or some other event and I don't get to play video games, my anger or frustration would make sense. Yelling and screaming and hitting and fighting as a result of that anger, well, that's not valid. The emotion of anger fits the facts and makes sense. So we can always say like, you can be angry, and it's not effective to act angry in a way that makes the situation worse. And then you can see there's some others on here, jealousy and love. Sadness makes sense when you've lost someone or something you care about. Um, shame makes sense when you've done something that's gonna get you criticized, judged, or kicked out of a community, 
right? So when you engage in some public behavior that goes against social norms, those are situations when shame might make sense. Um, and guilt, we think, makes sense when you've done something that goes against your own personal values or um, goals. That's when guilt makes sense. So guilt makes sense when you're doing something that you believe is wrong and it violates your own personal values. Shame makes sense when you are being rejected by a person or a group you care about um, over the community values or that person's values. Right. And so those are by having that information, I want you to be able to take that with your kids and to be able to validate when their emotions fit the facts, when they make sense. And then you can move into how do we help you regulate those? So hopefully that makes helps you with how and when do I validate and how do I teach my kids this, that their emotions make sense in a situation. And that's why we wouldn't want to ever try to get rid of them. So in addition to figuring out often how to downregulate the intensity of our emotions, one of the other really, really, really important things I think we want to make sure we're doing is helping ourselves and our kids to figure out ways to make effective deposits into what I call our emotional piggy banks, right? How do we add in as a way to decrease being completely depleted on the days we have to make emotional withdrawals, right? So if I do something every single day that is joyful, it's like I'm taking a vitamin. Every day I do something that is a pleasurable activity and brings me joy or gratitude. By being able to do that, those days that are rough when I have some high emotions and I feel I have to take a withdrawal, I won't completely bankrupt myself or go into a negative balance and then have to fight my way back through. So we want to think about in these busy lives that we have and our kids often have, how do we make sure we are finding time to experience joy and pleasurable activities at least 20 to 30 minutes every single day? Plan it, make time for it, organize your day around it will make a huge impact um, for those days when there's an emotional withdrawal. I think it's also really important that we work with our kids to what we say, identify their wise mind values. What are the values that they have that they wanna work to live towards and up to in their lives? And for many kids, sometimes these are values they're living with their parents' values or their family values. And as they become teenagers, they start to identify their own personal values that may stay the same as the family values or may start to diverge a little bit at any point. Um, but helping kids to identify their values and then to ask them the question, are you currently living your life in line with those values? And if you are, what are you doing to be able to do that? And let's do more of that. And if not, what are some goals we can set to help you take steps towards living more in line with your values. And then the last one is that I think is really helpful on this page, and then I'll get to another one, is the importance of building mastery. When I say mastery, I think of things that we consider a little bit hard, that we might not particularly enjoy doing, and when we've accomplished them, we feel joy, and a sense of competence and confidence, right? Those are the activities that teach us that I can do hard things, right? Being able to do something that's a little bit hard every day and acknowledge it, this is the key, with gratitude and joy and mastery activities. I also want you to work with your students in your home and in your home to acknowledge these behaviors every day. Because we often think of the things that are a little bit hard that we do as expected behaviors. I'm expected to be do this, so why would I acknowledge it, right? If for me, the mastery activity I often talk about that brings me the biggest sense of joy that I absolutely dislike doing is the putting away of laundry. I've got five people in my house. I think they all change their clothes three to four times a day. 
and there's always mounds of laundry to be done, folded, and then put away. And it is a chore that I do not enjoy. But when it is all put away and I can see my bedroom floor, I have this extreme sense of joy and I feel competence and confidence that I did something that was hard for me, even though I didn't want to, um, and to bring that together. And so I want to make sure like with our kids, maybe, you know, it's expected that they sit in their seats in class. They don't move around. They don't blurt out. And although that's expected behavior for many kids, that's really hard. And if they didn't blurt out all day, they must have been working really hard to regulate their urges and to raise their hand and wait to be called on. So we want to make sure we acknowledge that with them. So in my house, around our dinner table, I will tell you that every night um, that we're all at dinner, we go around the table and everybody has to share what are two things that you're grateful for or brought you joy in the last 24 hours. And what's one thing you did to build mastery in the last 24 hours? Um, and we go through and we talk about it. So we practice acknowledging that for ourselves and with each other and reinforcing that. Um, so I wanna encourage you to think about how do you help your kids to do that, to do find joy and where they had their joy in the day and where they built mastery. So I'll tell you what we pay attention to is what we get more of. Right, so if we only focus on when the kids aren't behaving well or doing things we don't like and fixing that, we'll only see more of that behavior. If we start focusing on and reinforcing what they did well, then we'll get more of that behavior too. So I want you to think about how, what that looks like. The fourth way that we can make deposits into our emotional piggy bank is, and a way to, to kind of decrease our emotion vulnerability is by taking care of our body. Um, and we do this by one, first, we call these our please skills to maintain your physical health, treat your physical illness. When you're sick, take care of yourself, right? If you can rest, lie down, go to the doctor, take medicine if needed, but really take care of your physical health. I know before the pandemic, myself included, many of us would still go to work or go to school or send our kids that way, even when they were sick, because they weren't really that sick. You weren't sick enough to have to stay home. And then they'd come home and have had a really rough day at school. You know, so we wanna think about how do we help them maintain their physical health? Um, limiting screen time. This is a really important one that helps decrease vulnerability emotions to emotions. And I don't just say this because um, I think video games are bad and TikTok and social media and all that is bad for us. I say that because there's brain research that shows that extended screen time especially fast moving screens like um, video games, short brief videos that pop from one to the other, um, they actually tire out our prefrontal cortex, this executive functioning center of our brains. So that when we stop the screen time, that part of our brain is tired and we're not able to um, problem solve and respond and use our self-control as effectively. So think about, have you ever had a time where maybe you gave one of your children or students extended screen time, like as a gift or a reward for them doing something? You're like, you know what? You can go play video games for a few hours, have fun. You've worked really hard this week. And you're thinking like, oh, I'm such an awesome adult. Like, look at me, like supporting and letting them do their video games. And then you say, okay, three, four hours, it's up, time to get off. And they don't get off. Or when they do get off, they're irritable and they're short and snappy with you. And you're like, I just thought I gave you a gift. I thought you'd have so much appreciation. And instead they're in a bad mood, right? That's because their prefrontal cortex is tired and it's not able to regulate it effectively. And when it's tired, it opens up the opportunity for our emotion mind to come in and take over. So I don't say get rid of screen time, but we want to limit it. 
Um, and to recognize that when they come off of it after those extended periods, that that's their brain functioning and their emotion mind starting to take control. Um, the E stands for eat a balanced diet, right? Not too much, not too little, um, not all junk food, you know, to be balanced in what you eat um, throughout the day. If anybody's like me, um, when I go several hours when I don't eat, I get really hangry. Or I talk about my kids who get really hiney, hungry and whiny when they don't eat for a long period of time, right? If you notice that, um, they're more emotionally reactive. So we want to make sure we're helping them eat a balanced diet. Talk about avoiding overindulgence. With our older kids and adults, we could refer to this as avoid mood altering drugs, things that are going to have extreme um, impact on your level of inhibition, your emotion regulation in that way. The S stands for getting balanced sleep, right? Again, not too much, not too little in these situations. And then exercise, move your body every day. Let's make sure our kids are moving their body at least 20 to 30 minutes every single day as a part of helping them regulate and be less vulnerable to their emotions. You know, in elementary school, this often happens when we have still have recess, but often as our kids get older and they move to middle school and high school, we take away recess. And what if they don't have PE that day or even that semester or that year, they're not in PE, how are they moving their bodies? So we wanna make sure we come up with a plan for that for them as well. As so again, these are all things that I want us to do in order to make deposits into our emotion piggy banks. So when those painful withdrawals have to come out, we're not completely depleted. All right, so think about those as well. The next thing that I think is really important and just a critical skill is teaching our kids about dialectical thinking, right? How to see both sides of a situation. Dialectical thinking comes from a philosophical worldview is that there is no absolute truth and there's multiple, solu multiple solutions to any problem or multiple ways we can see any situation. And as a result of that, this gives us different perspectives and really can help us to get unstuck when we are either stuck in a situation and kind of butting heads with another person, or we're just kind of stuck in an all or nothing position for ourselves. And so take just a quick moment, and I want you to look at this black and white figure um, on my screen. And just, to yourselves, just think about what do you see? All right, what do you see? Now, I'm gonna assume, because I've done this exercise before, that some of you see a lion. Some of you see a monkey hanging from a branch. Some of you see a deer with antlers. Some of you see the profile of a monkey's face in the bottom left corner. Some of you might see um, the profile of a human face on the upper right side. Some of you might see a tadpole, right? And now maybe as I'm saying all those things, you're seeing all of them at the same time. We're looking at things from different perspectives and sometimes we see things differently. And being able to ask our kids and ourselves, what's being left out? How can we bring up the other side? What might be another point of view, whether it's correct or incorrect? What be, might be another way to think about this? Another key part of dialectical thinking, and I say this every talk I get, if there's nothing at all that you find helpful that I've said tonight, I hope you take this one piece with you is, what I think the most important thing that we can do is to place the word but with the word and. To remove from yes, but to yes, and. That word but I always think about is like a giant eraser. It erases everything that came before it. 
right? So I might say, say like, I love my kids, but they whine so much, or they're always asking for things. Sounds different from, I love my kids and they whine so much and they're always asking for things, right? That dialectic allows me to hold up at the same time, I love them and they're driving me crazy versus I love them, erase that, but they're driving me crazy. It lands differently. It allows us to stay open and accepting of feedback Versus when I hear the word, but I always feel like I have to get in defensive, protect yourself and plan your counterattack mode. Right. I mean, they say like, you're working really hard, but, and I'm like, Oh, but what, what are they going to tell me? What did I do wrong? Versus you're working really hard. And, and then I'm like, okay. And what, give me the feedback. I can hold my hands open and vulnerable and willing to take feedback. So practice that. Maybe even do a challenge with your family or your classroom and say to them, you know, I'm really working on noticing what I say, the word, but, and I want to exchange that with the, and start using the word and more often. Will you help me? If you hear me say the word, but will you kindly, gently, non-judgmentally say, and, right, and help me pay attention to that. And then let me know what it feels like when I'm talking and I say, and instead of, but, and then you can ask. Do you want to try this with me? Can I also like highlight if you say but and help you to say and, and we'll see how that feels for us for a while. If that changes our communication at all, that can be really helpful as well. It just keeps us out of that defensive counterattack, thinking about what I'm going to say. And here I can sit back and open and take in the feedback I'm receiving while I'm not in a defensive shutdown fight or flight mode. So hopefully you find that helpful. Um, so what do you do when you have really painful emotions, right? I often think about this, um, that we have to first determine, are we an emotion mind or wise mind with our emotion or how intense is our emotion? And if you think of your emotion on like a scale of zero to hundred on a thermometer or even on a speedometer, Right? I often think of a 65 or higher. That's when I'm speeding. It's when my emotions are in control. Um, I'm in the red hot zone on, the th on a thermometer. But that's often what I think about like my skills breakdown point or my emotion mind is in control. And I'm just like holding on for dear life that I get through this emotion without acting on it and making the situation worse. Um, whereas when it's under 65, that's when I am not having as high a pressure to act on my emotion. And I can practice in that situation, sitting with and experiencing my emotion. We talk about like letting you, your emotion come in and go out like a wave. Notice the uncomfortable sensations that, um, accompany that emotion, like the nausea and twisting in your stomach or the weight on your chest when you're embarrassed or the hollowness in your heart when you have sadness, take all of your attention and mindfully focus it inside. So you're listening and you are present and you're just putting your attention on the physical sensations in your body. Because when we're doing that and we're just focusing on sensations, we're no longer fueling the thoughts that may be setting off that emotion over and over again. That we can typically do when our emotions a little bit lower and we can sit with it. When our emotions are really high and we're having high pressure to act on them and acting on them likely will make it worse. That's when I tell kids to engage in what we call effective distraction. Effective distraction is mindfully putting your attention away from whatever it is that's setting off your emotion so that you don't act on them. Right. And you might want to do this ahead of time where you generate a list of different things you can distract yourself, like word puzzles, going for a run, watching TV, playing with your pet. Um, you can sing songs. If you're feeling really sad, we might say, change, like, distract yourself with an opposite emotion by watching a scary movie or watching a comedy. Um, 
things like that. But come up with a list of things that are effective that you can do to distract yourself away from acting on your high emotion, right? And that's the goal is to help you not act on it with that one. All right, I have one more skill I wanna share with you before we take questions here. Um, the skill that I wanna talk about is what we say, call it opposite action. And you can absolutely Google the skill of opposite action and find more videos about it online as well. But the premise here with opposite as an action is that what we want to help you to change your emotion by changing your behavior. So imagine this, right? The way emotions work is every emotion also is connected to an action urge. I always think there's the urge to do a behavior and then there's the actual doing of the behavior, right? And so, for example, when we are scared, we have the urge to avoid or escape the thing that we're scared of. When we're sad, think about when you're sad. You often want to withdraw. You want to isolate. You don't want to see people. You don't want to do anything. When we're happy or joyful, we're active. We want to get engaged. We want to connect. Um, when we have shame or guilt, we want to hide. I'm embarrassed. I don't want anybody to see me. I might hide. Um, and when I'm angry, I have the urge to attack attack whatever is blocking my goals or how what, causing me to lose power and respect, right? So every emotion has an urge. And the more intense my emotion is, the more intense my urge is. So one of the ways that we can downregulate, bring down the intensity of our emotions is by actually changing our behavior, right? If we always wait to feel better to do something, we often end up waiting a really long time. But by changing our behavior and doing something, we can bring down the intensity of our emotion. And the specific way we want to change, the, change our behavior in order to change our emotion is by doing the opposite behavior to the emotion urge, right? So you can see on here, it says, when I'm scared, I have the urge to avoid. Well, the opposite of avoiding is to approach, move toward the thing that I'm scared of, if it's not actually dangerous. This is a key point. If it's dangerous, then we want you to problem solve and come up with a different solution to get away from it. But if it's not actually dangerous, um, then you wanna approach, right? If you're sad because you've lost something important to you, you wanna withdraw or isolate. But if you want your sadness to come down and it, makes sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit the facts that you should be sad um, in the short term, but in the long term, you want to get your sadness to come down. We say, get active, do something, engage in pleasurable activities like we talked about before. Um, joy, if you want to bring the intensity of your joy down, maybe you're having too much fun and you're getting too excited and that's going to be problematic. Maybe you need to step away for a little while in that situation. Um, if you're embarrassed because you raised your hand in class and you gave the wrong answer, right? That happens. And you want to hide and you want your shame to come down, be open. Go and do that behavior again. And then I think one of the most important ones is anger. When we're angry, we have the urge to attack. And even if my anger makes sense, attacking will often get me in trouble until I bring my anger down enough so I don't attack in a way that's gonna cause problems. So the opposite of attacking is to gently leave the situation and maybe be a little nice to the person or thing that you're angry toward. And you're not, I, what I think is so important here is that we don't want you to be nice because the person that you're being nice to might actually deserve it, it has nothing to do with them. Being nice is about because you want to bring the intensity of your anger down. So coming up with things that you can do as a way to decrease these emotion intensities, right? Activities and things you can do, behaviors, can also help downregulate, decrease the intensity of your emotion. So those are just a few ideas. You can always go on the internet to ask more questions about these. Um, we're gonna open it up for Q&A in just a moment here. And what I'll say is, um, if you have more questions and places that you want to kind of look for this, we have social media at DBT in schools where we often 
post a lot about different skills that you can use in your classroom or your home. Um, I also have a podcast that's called How Come They Didn't Teach Me That in School, which is all about the need for mental health in schools or our website. And that's a place where, um, again, if you just want more resources, we are happy to share our goal and our mission is to get these skills into your kids before they need outpatient therapy treatment um, to kind of help them build that sense of wellness and resilience. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to open it up for questions with the, our other panelists. Sorry, I'm still muted. Thank you so much um, for sharing with us and uh, and for us to learn alongside you. Um, I am not sure. I think you have bewildered some folks because there wasn't a lot of questions coming in. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure. I just checked with, uh, with Ernie and he said that he did not uh, have any questions that came in. But I really want to give people a minute or two to process um, what you were saying um, in in both English and Spanish. So there might be some uh, some questions that come to us on either side of tonight's presentation. So if they do, if something does come in, we got some thank yous in the chat. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's see if we have anything that's coming in. Let me see. I just lost my. Q&A. Okay. You know, one thing I'll say, if, as you're thinking about your questions, you can also think about putting in the chat, just to kind of solidify this a little bit for yourself, is one or two things that you took from this that you're going to try at home in your classroom, right? We want you to just not kind of just take the information, but also process it a little and say, I'm going to try this tomorrow. I'm going to try this next week in that way. That's a great idea. looks like we have, um, let's see, Jennifer has asked a question. I have always liked DBT. Um, so why is it that cognitive ther therapy is discussed and reimbursed? That was her question. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Jennifer, by cognitive therapy is discussed. Um, DBT is a type of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and it brings in both cognitions and behaviors and behavior change. The thing that separates DBT from cognitive behavioral therapy is the focus also that's very much on acceptance and validation um, and mindfulness that is brought into it. So it's looking at change strategies along with acceptance and mindfulness strategies. Um, in regards to reimbursement, you know, it's often difficult in general with reimbursement, um, adequate reimbursement for mental health treatment. Yeah, Veronica, um, I'm glad you found this information really helpful um, in regards to your six-year-old. I would say really start with anger is validating why their anger makes sense and then start separating. I understand why you're angry and what, how it's the, the problem with acting on their anger, but validating that when you're angry, you have that natural biological urge to attack. That is a really important thing that we acknowledge um, in our kids so that they don't think like, well, I'm angry and I don't know what to do. Their body's saying attack and we have to teach them how to regulate that and do that effectively. Excellent. Well, we'll keep that chat going there. Oh, wait, here's another one. There's some stuff coming in there. Mm -hmm. Lots of accolades. Uh, and thank you. Um, I'm going to give some accolades too, and, and practice the art of validation, if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, so just want to thank you again for your time tonight. And some of the takeaways um, that I had were just in the beginning when we talked about, um, or when you talked about, I was, I was mute and and no camera, so it was all you um, talking about the just the path to um, a wise mind, um, and then I loved the importance of of validating our our emotions as a building administrator. A lot of what I do with uh, my students is validating what their experience was, 
and whatever your, their experience was really becomes their reality. And so even if someone has a different lens that they may have seen that experience through, um, mm -hmm. it still is important. So, and then, uh, working through the emotions, um, and not, not to simply feel better. I think that those are, those are super important there. Um, it looks like some other questions have come in too. So I'll, well, let's jump over there. Yes, um, I'm just going to pop that up because someone just asked if they could see the opposite slide again. Um, you know, one of the takeaways that Kathy had was to use yes and um, as to validate first to help students name their emotions too. Great. I really do want to encourage you all to practice noticing when you say the word but. Stop and restate with the word and on that. Um, you know, Beatrice, you're saying, how do I help my 13-year-old son who may be having suicidal thoughts? First thing I'm going to say is go talk to your school counselors. Work with them um, on how do I work with your student and make sure they can assess and get effective and supports for your son in that. And you're, what you can do is validate that they're struggling and tell them, like, I'm here to help you figure it out together. You are not alone in this. Um, that would be my absolute first step for you to do is to really ask them, are you thinking about killing yourself? And then to reach out to your school counselors or your crisis line or your local mental health professionals um, to get you the supports for you and for him on that. Um, how can I help apply this with my son who has transition frustrations? You know, I'm a bit, I, like I started tonight, I always think about mindfulness as the first thing we do. Um, and I want to encourage you all, one of the, I know we had just only had a short hour here tonight. One of the places you can go to learn more of these skills um, in kind of a teaching format is at the beginning of the pandemic, my husband and I decided when our kids came home to do school from home, that since we were in charge of their school schedule, all of a sudden, that we were going to formally teach them all the skills from our social emotional learning curriculum. So twice a week for an hour, we made them sit in our living room um, with a whiteboard up and worksheets and we taught them our curriculum. And then as people asked us like, oh, can my kid watch that? How come I want my kids to have that? We actually started um, first on Zoom, but we live streamed it on YouTube and all those videos of our kids and our living room now live on YouTube on the YouTube channel for DBT in schools. So you can also go there and watch us teaching it to our kids who at the time were in second, sixth and seventh grades um, back then. And it seems so long ago because of these two years, the pandemic, you watch them with your kids and then talk about skills and lessons together. That's an option. Fantastic. Haley, go for it. Yeah. Um, so you touched on uh, limiting screen time a bit, but do you have any suggestions for families that are really struggling? They have too much screen time and they're trying to reel it in, but it's a big source of frustration. Mm -hmm. Do you have a way to, or some suggestions for families like that? That is something I um, hear a lot about. Yes. Um, I think the place to always start with that with families is around psychoeducation first. Like, don't just say like, screens are bad, we're turning them off and not give an explanation, right? The thing I do with my own kids who love their video games and their screens is I care too much about your brain and how it's developing and how it's working to just let it kind of be hurt and tired out and damaged by screens. Like first I said, and like, I am a big proponent of showing them um, different documentaries. So my kids and other kids, I always encourage to watch like Screenagers 1 and Screenagers 2 next chapter are both really good ones that um, I know agencies, they're not just, you can't just watch those on Netflix, but if schools do screenings, public screenings for those, those could be really helpful. The one that you can watch on Netflix is called The Social Dilemma, which talks about how social media was developed in order to make us all products, like teaching our kids that, you know, social media wasn't developed for you to enjoy. You are actually the product, not the customer. 
right? They are developed to make money. And the um, docudrama called The Social Dilemma was developed by all the executives who started the social media companies and then grew a conscience and realized what they had done. So left and then said, wait, you need to know what we did. Watch this and how we figured out how to manipulate your brain to want more of us. Um, so I think that's a really important start with psychoeducation and then having a heart to heart with your kids and your students that I just care about you too much to not do anything. Thank you. I'm reading what Gladys is um, sharing right now. Does somebody want to read that out loud? Or I can. I can. Yes, I. Okay, I go ahead. Uh, many times as parents, we want our kids to always be happy and not feel those emotions of anger or frustration. But it really resonated to me that when you mentioned that our goal is to help our children get through the difficult situation and not necessarily remove those emotions. I think it's truly important to validate our children's feelings and support them by helping them learn to regulate their emotions and get through what it is that they're struggling. I have a nine-year-old child, a two-year-old and a one-year-old and I'm learning every day. Yes, I think you, Gladys, you said that so well, right? We really want um, to teach our kids that um, we're biologically hardwired to have emotions. You cannot not do emotions and you can't get rid of emotions. And um, how can you embrace the discomfort that comes along with painful emotions, right? We don't have to push them away. We can embrace them. Our emotions are there to teach us and give us information and to motivate us into action, right? Like I always think like we never want to get rid of anxiety. It's effective. If my anxiety is too little, like if I have a big test coming up, but I'm not anxious at all about it, and very unlikely to study for it. But if my anxiety is too high, I'm likely to like freeze and freak out and forget everything when I'm on, when I think I need to study. So I want just enough of anxiety. I want a moderate amount of anxiety that'll motivate me to study and won't overwhelm me. We don't wanna get rid of our anxiety. We wanna have some. Excellent. Very well said. I uh, appreciate that. What I'm trying to see if we had any other questions. I didn't see any more in the Q&A and uh, didn't see any more in the chat. What a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it has just been an incredible night uh, for us. And I think probably most people are like, just, oh, that's a lot of information and a lot of great things. And we're just like, whoa, that's so cool. So um, just from the bottom of our hearts here at the Wenatchee School District and the Wellbeing Project, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us. Um, and uh, and and honestly, for us keeping you away from maybe putting some laundry away. I don't know if that uh, we can say that as part of it, but uh, um, anyway, you are, you're greatly appreciated. We want to thank all the families um, and students and staff members who were able to join us. Um, you are all so greatly appreciated. We're just excited to partner with our community and do this work together to educate our students and, and our community in general. I love the accolades that folks were sharing there and, and the takeaways that this was powerful and it was meaningful for them. And uh, we, we want to do this again. So I love it. A um, few people I want to thank um, besides yourself, Dr. Meza, thank you so much for your time. Thank you um, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And all of the time, effort, and... Uh, um, you know, that you put into getting ready for this evening was just outstanding. Um, I want to thank the, my colleagues in the Wellbeing Project. Uh, to, we had um, some, were, some behind the scenes and some popped on here. We've got Rhonda Brender, Bob Sanford, Haley Griffith, who you saw there, Ernie Garza, who's been really the man behind the curtain as he's been uh, doing some cool, fun stuff there, uh, Sarah Butler, uh, and then Fidelina Polito. Uh, she's on our um, Spanish side of things. So she's been, she's as tired as you are at this point. She's been talking a lot. So we appreciate her. And then um, at the cabinet level, and uh, thank you for your technology, Ron Brown, um, and then Diana, Diana Haglin for um, doing some of the marketing for this night. And uh, 
Mike Lane and Dr. Paul Gordon for helping to make this all happen and to make it a reality. So with that, I'll let everybody get back to their evenings. Um, and thanks everybody so much. Have a great night. We appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.